Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where OP becomes a millionaire and his girlfriend gives up on her career. My girlfriend has given up on her career after I became a millionaire. How do I tell her this won't work out? I met my girlfriend, Kylie, in community college seven years ago. We became really close friends and started dating two years later. At that time, she was determined to become a nurse, which I fully supported because of her passion for it. I eventually transferred to a four-year university and I earned my MBA. Kylie provided unwavering emotional support throughout my school journey, for which I am truly grateful. However, Kylie's parents eventually cut her off financially due to her spending habits, which led her to take a year off to work and help manage her bills. During this time, I invested all my savings, time, and energy into a startup platform with my best friend in the automotive industry. Earlier this year, we were bought out for a life-changing amount of money. As part of the deal, we both remained on as consultants with high-paying salaries. Meanwhile, Kylie continued her job at the jewelry store. After the buyout, she decided to hand in her two weeks notice at her job. I offered to pay for her schooling and living expenses and initially she was excited about going back to earn her nursing degree. I even purchased a condo for us to live in which was a significant step up from our previous apartment and conveniently located near her school. Over the weekend, during a conversation, she mentioned that she wasn't sure about returning to school and even suggested the idea of being a stay-at-home wife even though we're not even married. I didn't respond immediately because I was unsure how to process it. Part of what initially attracted me to her was her ambition and this sudden shift in her goals was concerning to me. Additionally, I've noticed her spending habits have increased since my financial change. She's been looking at new cars and making purchases that feel impulsive. I worry that I might be overreacting, but something about this new side of her feels off. I still love her and want our relationship to work, but I'm struggling with how her actions and attitudes have changed. Not sure what kind of advice you want here. It's pretty easy to tell her that you never wanted a stay-at-home spouse. You want a partner that's also contributing to the household and that you really valued her ambition towards having her own career and independence. You need to have a really frank discussion that as of right now, your assets are not shared wealth. OP. So here's another detail I left out. Her mom was a stay-at-home mom. Her dad is very well off, so I don't think she sees anything wrong with her decision. That's the family life she was raised in. When we first got together, she said she wanted to be the complete opposite of her mom. She wanted to be independent and have a career. In the future, if we end up having kids after getting married, I don't mind her being a stay-at-home mom. But for now, that's way too far down the line. I mean, generally there's nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home partner or spouse, but that has to be a mutual decision. Stay-at-home parent? Absolutely nothing wrong with that. 25-year-old stay-at-home boyfriend or girlfriend? No. There is very much something wrong there. Am I the jerk for being angry that my roommate was sleeping under my bed for months without telling me? I, 24 male, have been living with my roommate Carl, who's also 24, for about two years. A few months into rooming together, he told me he was pan. I said, alright, cool. I'm not particularly interested in people's personal information like that, nor am I judgmental about it. I thought we were done with the topic. Then last night, I had one of the scariest experiences of my life. It was around 3 a.m. when I heard a strange noise coming from under my bed. At first, I thought I was imagining things, but then I heard it again, a movement. My first thought was, oh no, is there a mouse or a rat under there? So feeling uneasy, I got out of bed and used my phone flashlight to look underneath. What I saw next shocked me to my core. There, under my bed, was my roommate Carl, staring wide-eyed back at me. He screeched the moment I looked at him. In that instant, I felt terror like never before, like a physical jolt of fear. For a second, I genuinely thought that I might be having a heart attack. All I could hear after that was him saying, Sorry, 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 over and over. He crawled out from under the bed, crying and apologizing nonstop. I was so freaked out and terrified that I ran out of the apartment in my pajamas. I ended up at a 24-hour Dunkin' Donuts a few blocks away, trying to calm down with a decaf coffee and a breakfast sandwich, my heart still pounding. Meanwhile, Carl kept texting me, asking to talk. I ignored every message, but then he sent something that horrified me even more. He confessed that he had been sleeping under my bed a few nights a week for three to four months. He claimed he was doing it to get closer to me. I waited until I knew he had gone to work, ran back to the apartment, grabbed my essentials, and left. I'm currently crashing at a friend's place. Our lease is up in a month and I fully intend not to renew. Since then, Carl has been blowing up my phone and now I'm even getting texts from mutual friends. Some of my friends, as well as a few of his, are saying that I shamed him and I'm rejecting his apologies. 
While most people agree he was way out of line, some think I should give him a second chance because he's sensitive. Honestly, I feel like I'm losing my mind. Part of me is 20% convinced I'm stuck in a long, lucid nightmare, or maybe I'm in a coma somewhere, and all of this is just some insane dream. So, am I the jerk here, or is everyone around me just completely nuts? Yes, you did shame him. Yes, you rejected his apologies. Why? Because he crossed so many boundaries of common decency, privacy, and basic human respect. Whatever trust you had in Carl has been broken, shattered into a thousand pieces, not the jerk. My boss said, just follow the script, so I did, all the way to a million dollar client meltdown. I work in customer support for a company that provides specialized software to major players in the healthcare industry. Our clients aren't your average users, they're hospitals, clinics, and medical centers where downtime can have serious consequences. I've been with the company for five years and I know our software inside out, so I'm often able to troubleshoot unusual problems and get things back on track without a hassle. A few months ago though, a new supervisor named Alex joined us. He was fresh from a corporate management program and came in with grand ideas about efficiency and productivity. In his mind, the solution to our slow response time was simple, a script-only policy. According to him, every client interaction needed to be scripted to prevent wasting time on unnecessary advice. No more custom solutions, no additional steps, no thinking outside the box. If a client's issue wasn't in the script, we were to log it, escalate it, and have them wait for a callback. When Alex announced the new policy, I raised my hand, explaining that most clients call us precisely because they're dealing with specific, time-sensitive issues. Sticking rigidly to the script would just frustrate them and, in many cases, fail to solve their problems entirely. Alex didn't budge. Everyone follows the script, no exceptions, he said, smiling in that overconfident way that made it clear he thought he was reinventing the wheel. If even our biggest client calls, you follow the script. Cue a couple of weeks later. One morning, I pick up a call and I'm greeted by the CEO of one of our top clients, a massive healthcare network we've worked with for years. They hold a multi-million dollar contract with us and losing them would be catastrophic. The CEO is calling in a panic because their entire system is down. The glitch they're dealing with is blocking patient records and diagnostics, putting patients' care at risk. This isn't just a technical issue, it's affecting people's health. As soon as he describes the issue, I recognize the problem. It's a known bug with a straightforward five minute workaround, something I've handled a dozen times before. But here's the thing, the fix isn't in the script. I'm immediately torn. My instincts tell me to help him, to do my job and prevent a disaster. But Alex's strict orders echo in my head. Follow the script, no exceptions. If I help, I risk my job. If I don't, I risk the client's contract and possibly lives. So I do exactly as Alex told me to do. I go through the script step by painful step. The CEO is losing patience fast. As I drone through basic troubleshooting steps he clearly doesn't need, he interrupts, asking why I'm wasting time. I explain the policy. I'm only allowed to offer solutions that are in our scripts. If this doesn't fix it, I can escalate the case and someone will call you back within 24 hours. He goes dead silent, then says, Escalate it now! I log the issue as required, escalating it for a callback. Within an hour, word spreads that Alex has been summoned to an emergency meeting with our department head. Apparently, the CEO of our client had gotten in touch with our company's leadership directly and wasn't mincing words. He demanded an explanation for the sudden drop in our service quality and threatened to take his business elsewhere. Rumor has it, he even said, If your idea of support is running through a script instead of fixing the problem, then we're done here. By the end of the day, we all received an email titled, Script Policy Update. Effective immediately, we were now encouraged to use best judgment and to go off script as needed for high priority issues. Alex's entire efficiency plan was scrapped on the spot and he's now under performance review. It's safe to say he's lost any respect from our team and I'm not sure his reputation will ever recover after that blunder. In the days that followed, the story of the client meltdown spread like wildfire through our office, growing more exaggerated with each telling. Some people said the CEO threatened to sue. Others claimed he had hinted at buying out a competitor. Regardless of the details, Alex's name became a kind of cautionary tale, a reminder of what happens when you put rigid policies above common sense. And as for me, well, I've been doing my job the way I always have, thinking on my feet, solving problems, and trusting my instincts. The difference now is, I have a little smirk every time I think about it. After all, I was just following orders.
Am I the jerk for not being friendly with my partner's daughters now that they've warmed up to me? I, 42, am dating Tim, 59, a widower. He works in banking and I'm a bartender. I know how it looks and his two daughters thought the same, assuming I was with him for money. But actually, Tim is broke as a joke while I have a trust fund, so the reality is quite the opposite. Tim's financial situation is largely due to his late wife's battle with cancer, three rounds of it. He ran up six credit cards, took a second mortgage on their house, cashed out his retirement, and did everything possible to ensure she received the best treatment. Later, he helped her hang on long enough to see both their daughters get married. His daughters live a six-hour drive away, and for the past two Christmases, we've driven out to see them. Both times, they ignored me, pulled Tim aside whenever he tried to include me, and prevented their husbands from even making small talk with me by interrupting every time I spoke. The first year, Tim chastised them and they apologized, but only to him. They blamed their behavior on the pain of seeing their dad with a woman who wasn't their mom. The second year, they did it again. This year, I told Tim I wouldn't go. He's welcome to go visit his daughters for Christmas. I would never ask him not to, but I'll stay here. Tim wasn't thrilled about the idea because he relies on me to share the driving when his back acts up and he hates to fly. Besides, his 2010 death trap of a car is on its last legs, so I leased him a comfortable luxury ride, thanks to my brother who owns a dealership. Tim was excited about the car and called his daughters to share the news, especially since it means he could visit more often without worrying about his back. They completely lost it, accusing him of spending their mother's money on a BS house and a car to impress me, while as they claimed, he never offered them a dime for their weddings. During the argument, it came out that they assumed there had been a life insurance policy. They had no idea about the credit card debt, the second mortgage, or that the house was underwater and close to foreclosure before Tim moved in with me. They didn't realize that it's my house, that Tim pays no bills, except for the water, he takes excessive showers, and that we share grocery costs. Now, the daughters want my phone number, saying they're sorry that I felt lonely during past Christmases. They also want to visit and stay with us next year, conveniently in the summer, as I happen to live near a beach. I told Tim that I absolutely don't want him giving out my number. I'll be polite if they come to visit him, but I'm not looking to be friends with them. If they had taken two seconds to speak to me, they would have known better than to assume I was with him for the money. Tim thinks I'm being too unforgiving. He believes his daughters would have warmed up to me eventually and that knowing how generous I've been with him is what's finally bringing them around. But I honestly don't care whether they come around now or later. They had their chance to get to know me without jumping to conclusions, and now they choose to act like catty brats instead. Not the jerk. These are grown women, not angry kids, and you owe them nothing. Certainly not the money and favors they very obviously want. But also, I'm extremely concerned that your husband never set the record straight. This man spent two years watching his daughters treat you like a gold digger and never once told them off and told them the truth. You have bigger problems than horrible stepkids. Am I the jerk for abruptly cutting my ex-fiancé out of my life? I, 25 male, met my now ex-fiancé in my first year of college. We were both 18 and went from friends to lovers pretty quickly. We clicked so well and everything was so easy and effortless. We had a really good relationship. It was the kind of relationship that everyone dreams of, one that people idolized and would say, if those two break up, then love doesn't exist. You get the picture. For the purpose of this post, let's call my ex Ashley. Ashley was everything I was looking for in a woman. Funny, smart, attractive, down-to-earth, and family-oriented. She wanted to build a life together, and our families grew close over the course of our relationship. It was like we were already one big family even before getting married. As planned, I popped the question a year ago, not knowing this would change everything. She said yes, of course, but things began to change. Slowly but surely, over the months, she became more distant. I tried to ignore it, chalking it up to nerves. You know, cold feet before taking the big marriage plunge? But I should have trusted my instincts. She started going out with her friends more often on the weekends. I'd gone on these outings with her before. It was usually clubbing and drinking. It wasn't really my scene, but I trusted her, so I had no problem with her going without me. After I proposed, though, these outings became much more frequent. I had this nagging feeling that something was off, but I brushed it aside, convinced that my doubts were just wedding jitters. I should have listened to my gut. Then, last week, I got a text from one of her girlfriends. She said that she felt super guilty about what had been going on. According to her, Ashley had been having second thoughts about getting married. She felt that she hadn't had the chance to explore other options, and that the thought of being locked down for life was making her really anxious. 
Apparently, on these outings, Ashley would flirt with guys, dance with them, and even make out with them to get it out of her system. Since she wasn't hooking up with them, she didn't consider it cheating. But her friend told me that there was one night when she hooked up with a guy at the club. She even sent me pictures and videos from some of those nights. My heart sank. I thanked the friend for telling me and asked her to keep it between us. For me, any form of cheating is a hard no. I knew it was over. What made it worse was my history with cheating. Ashley knew about my high school ex who cheated on me and how I struggled to cope after that. This situation just made it cut even deeper. She knew how much it could hurt, yet she did it anyway. I wanted to crawl into bed and cry for a month. I wanted to be weak. I felt weak. But I decided to let myself mourn and break down only after I protected myself first. Ashley and I shared an apartment, which we split the rent on 50-50. I decided to take two days off work and covertly started moving my things to my brother's house across the city. He knew everything that had happened and immediately offered me a place to stay. The first day, I moved out my non-essential items. When Ashley got home from work, she noticed some things were missing, but I just told her I'd sold a few things and moved some others to storage to clear out space in the apartment. She didn't question it. I was furious on the inside, but I kept cool to avoid suspicion. She noticed I was a bit withdrawn, but I told her I was just tired and stressed from work. On the second day, while she was at work, my brother and his wife came over to help me pack up the rest. By 3 p.m., I was fully moved out. Since then, I've ignored every single text and call from her. I've completely cut her off and refused to talk to her or her family. I don't even want to confront her about what happened. She came home to an empty apartment, and since then, she's been texting all my friends and family who in turn have texted me. I only responded to my parents who fully support my decision. Her family and friends though have been blowing up my phone, calling me a jerk for leaving without a word. They've even been blasting me on social media. I don't really care. She knows what she did. To me, she's done. She doesn't exist anymore. Because of all the backlash, even my brother and his wife started questioning whether it was right of me to completely ignore everyone. It's made me doubt myself a bit, which is why I'm here. Am I the jerk? Update. I didn't want to make this public. Despite everything, part of me still cares about her. We were together for six years, and it's not something you just throw away overnight. I realized that the right thing to do was to talk to her parents. Only her family needed to know. Everyone else could think whatever they wanted about me. I didn't care. The people who truly know me are all that matter. I sent a detailed message to my closest friends and family, explaining everything. They believed me right away. No pictures were needed. I didn't feel it was appropriate to spread these photos of her, so I didn't. With the people I cared about now understanding the situation, I moved on to talk to her parents. I reached out to her mom, who I'd gotten close to, and she considered me like a son. She was upset with me, but agreed to meet. I thought an in-person conversation would be better than dropping a bombshell email. I met her mom and dad at a diner we used to go to for breakfast. It was emotional. They were understandably upset that I cut them out without a word. I just sat quietly and listened while they got everything off their chests. I admit, I teared up a bit. But then they started accusing me. It turns out Ashley had told them I cheated on her and that she was the one who kicked me out. And because I wasn't responding to anyone, everyone believed I was too ashamed to show my face. I couldn't help but laugh out loud. I said I was sorry that they had been lied to and wished them a good life. Then I walked out. I was beyond angry. I couldn't believe her parents would believe her and throw me under the bus so quickly. I walked out because I knew I'd say things I regret if I stayed. I hadn't wanted to, but she left me no choice. I went nuclear. I went home, wrote an email titled, For Your Reading Pleasure, and attached every single picture her friend had sent me, along with screenshots of the chat with her friend, where she admitted to feeling guilty about Ashley's cheating. I attached the videos. I included a long explanation detailing everything that happened since D-Day, ending with a note saying I didn't want to be contacted and that I expected my ring back eventually. I sent it to her, her parents, every friend I could think of, and even a coworker. I didn't care. So that's where I'm at now. I might be the jerk for sending that email, but when she spread lies about me, she really tested my limits. I have zero regrets. Right now, I'm crashing at my brother's place on the pullout couch. He's helping me through this as much as one can, I guess. Final update. The fallout from that email was catastrophic. My phone was blowing up with calls and texts from Ashley's friends and family, asking tons of questions. Before the email, everyone thought I was the cheater who had been kicked out, but the email cleared my name and essentially turned everyone against her. Rumors started circulating at her job. She couldn't handle the embarrassment and ended up quitting. Her parents refused to take her back in and they reached out to apologize for jumping to conclusions. We're cool now, but they told me Ashley was struggling to make rent. 
As for our shared friends, most of them cut ties with her after realizing she had manipulated them into hating me. Even some of her girlfriends who knew about her cheating stopped talking to her. Ironically, the friend who initially came forward to tell me everything is now my girlfriend. We started texting more after everything went down and she became a big support for me. We connected over shared interests, life goals, and experiences. Things naturally evolved from there. She's amazing, kind, loving, and supportive. Some people might think it's just a rebound, but I'm genuinely happy with her. Since all of this happened, I haven't contacted Ashley, nor do I plan to. Friends tell me she's livid that I ghosted her without giving her closure. Honestly, if she thinks she deserves closure after everything, she's lost it. I've moved on, and I'm happier now than ever. Am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend I won't move in with her because her rent demands are unreasonable? My girlfriend and I have been together for a while. While I make good money, my girlfriend actually had a house she's making payments on. We discussed moving in together and she doesn't feel entirely comfortable adding me to her mortgage, even though we do want to get married eventually. I said it's fine and I get it. This is her house and she's been dealing with it for years now. But obviously, I don't want to be a kept man. I currently rent a place and it's relatively decent for the price. Anyway, we were making calculations and her demand on my rent for her is twice as much as what I pay for my own place. I told her that is absolutely ridiculous. She claims it's what her house would rent for in the market. Not inaccurate. But I told her that only works when the landlord is not at the house and that at most I'd be renting just one room. I could afford it if I don't save as much, but it would be too close for comfort. She says I'm just making excuses and I told her I'm not going to be paying that much. She insists she really wants to live together, but she said that I need to pull my own weight. You're the jerk. You're not just renting one room. You're using the whole house. Are you not using the bathroom there? Or kitchen? Dining? Living areas? A fair arrangement would be to pay slightly more than half the actual costs of expenses and upkeep, because technically, she would be paying taxes on the rent incoming. And no, you wouldn't be added to the mortgage. She's right here. Not the jerk. My girlfriend recently moved in with me in the home that I own. I never expected her to pay half my mortgage like these commenters are suggesting. We worked out a plan together where she helps with groceries and utilities, but I don't expect her to pay me rent like I'm her landlord. I'm her boyfriend, and I'm glad to have her staying here with me. Relationships have become too transactional. I wouldn't want to be in a relationship with someone who saw me as a tenant. Am I the jerk for not providing any kind of extra support for my kid's other household? I have two kids who are 11 and 8 with my ex and we share both physical and legal custody. I pay child support as I'm the higher earner. The amount is relatively low at $150 a month intended to help balance resources between our homes. My ex remarried and her household now includes her husband, his three kids, all who are under 10, and two kids they have together, both under 5. Financially, they struggle. Over the past 4 years, they've tried to increase my child support payment 5 times. Twice, we appeared in front of a judge, while the other three times the request was denied before reaching court. Each time, the judge emphasized that child support is intended only to support our two kids, not her entire household. Despite this, my ex and her husband argued that their financial strain justifies an increase, seeking a total of $800 per month, but this argument hasn't been successful. My ex has also repeatedly asked me for small amounts of extra money, like $50 here and there, or even to buy things for the other kids in her household, sometimes even when our kids are with me. I have consistently refused, explaining that I'm only responsible for my own kids' needs, not those of her other kids. This issue recently escalated after our daughter's birthday, which falls close to the birthday of her youngest step-sibling. Our daughter enjoyed celebrations and received gifts, both at my house and at her mom's, plus I hosted a big party for her. Meanwhile, her step-sibling didn't have a party or receive many gifts due to financial constraints. My ex had asked me twice to send gifts for her stepkid, which I declined. She also wanted her other kids invited to the party, but my daughter didn't want them there, so I respected her wishes. This clearly upset my ex. Then, just days after the birthday, my ex informed me that her stepkid's school lunch accounts had gone negative. She knew I had topped up our kids' accounts, so she asked me to do the same for her stepkids, which I also refused. Following this, she called me a monster and asked how I could live with myself, knowing that my kid's other family is struggling so much. She pointed out that I could help them avoid drowning in financial difficulty, but I choose not to. In my view, I'm simply sticking to my responsibility towards my own kids. I contribute financially as required and provide for them while they're in my care. Helping to support her other kids who are not mine is not my responsibility. Am I the jerk? 
Is it possible to have the kids live with you? What she's doing sounds very manipulative. I truly hope this doesn't turn into a situation where it's making your kids feel bad or even make the stepkids resent your kids over time. As much as I am for helping any kid, you're in the right to not feel obligated to take care of someone else's kid. Not only that, she is sure acting entitled about the situation. I would save these messages and see what can be done to make things not just easier on you, but the kids as well. If you can, it sounds like they just need to live with you instead. I'm shocked that you don't have to pay more. My son pays $450 a week for two kids. His ex gets another $350 a week for a kid she had with another guy. She's now pregnant with number four with some new guy. She has never worked a day in her life. Every time she goes to court looking for more money, the judge gives it to her. Only had one judge ask her why she doesn't work, and she replied she has anxiety, so she can't work. Karen demands to pick apples from my yard. I work from home, and today I saw a woman who I didn't know knocking on my front door. When I went and answered the door, I was in the middle of a work Zoom meeting that I was co-leading, and I was a little irritated because she kept ringing the doorbell until I would answer. The woman told me she was driving by my house and could see my large apple trees in my backyard filled with big apples. She then asked if she could come into my backyard to pick them for herself and take home. I explained that it wasn't a good time as I was working. She dismissed my words and further said she wouldn't bother me, but she wanted me to let her into my back gate that I had locked and she would just pick the apples for herself to make a jam while I worked. I felt she was being pushy and not listening to me, so I told her again, no, it wasn't a good time. Again, she proceeded to interrupt my words and tells me she was driving by randomly, so she might not be on my side of town again, so it worked best for her to pick them now. At this point, I'm worrying about my meeting and getting irritated, so I tell her she can pick them if she gives me $50, almost to appease her or make her go away. She gets very angry at my offer and starts to yell on my porch that I should give them to her for free because there's no way I can eat all the apples and they'll probably go to waste or rot in my yard. She yells at me that she was doing me a favor by taking the apples and I should actually pay her. I was kind of dumbstruck at this point that this strange woman was yelling at me now for not letting her onto my private property during the workday to take things from my yard for free and getting mad at me for telling her no. I again tell her if she wants to pay me, I'll let her do it, but she can't do it for free now. She ends up losing it and huffs off to her car while telling me I was selfish and greedy. So, am I the jerk for not letting a stranger come into my backyard to pick food for free to take it home without paying me for it? Not the jerk. This was an entitled crazy person. You'd have been taking a big risk if you had said yes because letting a crazy person onto your property can lead to bigger issues. OP. This was my thinking at first. I didn't know her and she was a stranger. I'm not someone that would randomly knock on someone's door, so for me it seemed out of my comfort to begin with. Not the jerk. You don't owe anyone free things. Owning something means you have complete control over the use and distribution of it. If she was polite or offered to split what she picked with you, maybe. But her demanding your property just makes her an entitled jerk and nothing else. Not the jerk, but you might be the jerk to yourself if this is an example of how you say no to people. No is the entire answer and doesn't need to be followed up with anything. She asks, you say, oh, no, have a great day and close the door. There was no need for any further conversation. Am I the jerk for telling my friend it's her fault for getting married and having kids late because the world won't wait on her now? I, 39 female, have a six-person girl group since college, 37 to 39, and that includes Mary, who's 38. We've been close throughout the years and have been at milestone events for each other. Mary just had a baby and is completely fitting the crazy new mother stereotype. In college, Mary had always been someone who had to make it known that she was unique and different from the rest of us, which wasn't as draining then as it has become now. For starters, all other women in our circle got married between the ages of 22 and 27, and we all have multiple kids. So, the five of us were able to experience those milestones alongside one another, and we got closer as we shared similar lifestyles. Mary was very adamant on not settling until her 30s, because she wanted to travel and have different experiences, which we all supported. Regardless, she would continue to make comments about how she's so lucky, unlike us, because we're tied down with husbands and babies. I think this is where she grew resentment towards us because we were in different places in life and she was upset we couldn't have our group be similar to how it was in college. 
Then in our mid-30s, it became a whole saga of she's getting older and can't find a husband because all the good men are married or divorced with kids. When she finally got married, many could not attend because it was a destination event and child-free during lockdown. This caused a fight because she said how she was there for us during our weddings, but we couldn't put aside one week for her. We had all told her how we wished we could, but it simply was not financially feasible and didn't logistically work out with our kids. But she refused to hear us out and was simply so inconsiderate about our lives and families, saying we were horrible friends. Now, Mary just gave birth to her first baby and I was very excited for her. The only issue is that she moved from our state to a very remote place that's only accessible by a six-hour car ride. Her baby is six months old and none of us have been able to go up to visit her. I think she's been having a wrong idea of what a village is and has essentially demanded in our group chat that we come up for the holidays and help her out because she's having a hard time adjusting to mom life. But this would entail we all take a week off, arrange childcare, figure out transportation, and book hotels during the holidays. It's gotten to the point where she's posting cryptic messages on Facebook bashing fake friends who won't be there for her. As much as I wish I could, I cannot physically support her in the way she needs me to in this stage of life. It would have been completely different if she still lived in our city and this was earlier in life when we had less commitments and priorities. So I told her this and that if she was hoping for this big village and constant support, she should have thought about that when planning out her life because we can't all just pause our lives for her. So am I the jerk? I have to ask, has she provided a lot of support to the group? Was she there for your weddings, which may have made difficult demands on her? Has she provided time and resources for the group's kids over the years, such as babysitting and the like? Edit. I ask because, as the childless one in the friend group, I'm often expected to be ride or die, but when it comes to returns on the favors, sorry bro, like, it's just too hard with the kids, comes up a lot. Sure, if some of those stories were told, I'd look like an entitled jerk. P.S. I'm absolutely ride or die in general, but some people are seriously ungrateful. Right. I get the vibe that OP thinks that Mary didn't have to put effort and pause her own life to attend their weddings and help them, as she was unmarried and childless. Mary could have made a lot of sacrifices and efforts to attend their weddings and help them out, but now these friends won't even visit her? OP claims she can't put her life on pause, but has she thought about the fact that her friend might have done so for her? I think Mary's wrong for being rude about your life choices but doing the same thing makes you no different than her. Edit. Not talking about the destination wedding. It's completely understandable that OP couldn't attend that. But can she visit her now that she's had a baby? Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.